Well, good evening, and I want to welcome you to Forecasting Hope in today's age. My name is Pastor D.W. West, and it's a huge blessing to be here with you tonight as we are going to take a look at the subject, the law, the Antichrist movement. The law, the Antichrist movement. But before we dig into the word today, um, I just want to let you know, if you're watching from somewhere, there's going to be a website that you can go to. Uh, you can let us know uh, who is watching, where you're watching from. If you want to become a host site, if you want to host this at your church or possibly um, at your home, if, if that's what you want, you can text the number or you can call the number that's going to pop up on the screen right now. And we're going to go ahead and have a word of prayer. And we're going to dig right into this word today, the law, the Antichrist hates. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity. I pray that you will hide the preacher behind the shadows of the cross, so that I will not be seen nor heard, but that Jesus would be seen and Jesus would be heard. And we'll be sure to give him all the praise and honor and glory, for we pray it all in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and amen. Again, today we are looking at forecasting hope in today's age, the law the Antichrist hates. So today, as we look at the law the Antichrist hates, I want to take a look at, at a few different things here. Uh, first, we're, we're going to go to the Pittsburgh Synagogue shooting. This happened in a, a where a middle-aged man entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in the Squirrel Hill neighborhood, and the worship services were going on at the time. He was armed with a Colt AR-15 semi-automatic rifle and three semi-automatic pistols. As he maneuvered from one room to another, he fired at everyone in his path. People barricaded themselves into closets and behind closed doors. Now, multiple calls were made to 911. 11 people were killed, six wounded, and a whole neighborhood has been turned upside down with pain and grief. And then we see that the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting happened in Parkland, Florida. This happened in Parkland, Florida, and everyone was thinking about love, but there was no love on this day, for it was Valentine's Day. And a 19-year-old man entered the building 12 at, at this high school, and he was armed with an AR-15-style semi-automatic rifle and multiple magazines, and he activated them, a fire alarm, and he indiscriminately fired at students and teachers as they were exiting classrooms as they were exiting classrooms. He then would go from one classroom to another, shooting those who are left, who were left. And within six minutes, 17 people are killed and another 17 wounded, and families are devastated, and a whole campus became numb, and it became the deadliest high school shooting in United States history. Which brings us to 2017 Las Vegas shooting. The 2017 Las Vegas shooting, a 64-year-old man reserves a couple rooms on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel overlooking the grounds of Route 91. Now, this was the Harvest Music Festival on the Las Vegas Strip, and over a period of five or six days, he stockpiled an arsenal of high-powered weapons in the room, including AR-15 rifles. Amazingly, nobody noticed, and on the night of October 1st, when a concert was taking place on the grounds below, he began to open fire through a window on the crowd below. He fired more than 1,100 rounds of ammunition in a 10-minute period. Now, in that short amount of time, he killed 58 people and wounded 413 and if you include those wounded in the ensuing panic and stampede, it brings the total wounded to 869. An hour later, he was found dead in his room from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and his motive was unclear, 
because it was the deadliest mass shooting committed by an individual in United States history. And I want you to see that these are isolated incidents. I want to say they don't happen very often, but you know it's not true. You read the newspapers, you watch the news, you follow social media, it's happening on a regular basis, it's becoming a normal part of our society in the 21st century, and it causes people to ask the question, why? What's going on, and why does it seem as if our world is falling apart at the seams? I want you to look at these statistics. What is going on? What is going on? So, as we look at these statistics, it says that 1.2 million violent crimes are happening every year. 267,000 robberies are happening every year. It also tells us that a burglar occurs every 13 seconds. A burglary occurs every 13 seconds. And then 10 million people are physically abused every year. Not only that, but drug use among teenagers has become an epidemic. Statistics tell us that there are 267,000 robberies that occur every year in the United States of America alone, let alone the crime rate across the world, and there is a burglary every 13 seconds. Can you imagine this? 10 million people are physically abused every year. I want you to put this into perspective. This is 20 people every single minute. 20 people every single minute. So again, what is going on? What is going on? Well, 437,000 people are sexually abused each year. Uh, the pornography is a multi-million, excuse me, a multi-million dollar industry. Half of all marriages fail. And 11 million single-parent families have become the normal. Now there's even cyber crime, and there's dishonesty, and corruption, and intimidation. And this is what we are dealing with. And the statistics about the family tell us even more. And, and with 80% of them being headed by single mothers. And it's not just happening in American society, it's occurring in societies and cultures all around the world, all around the world. Now, when you look at the statistics like this, it tends to get your attention, and you go back to the original question, why is this happening? Why does it seem as if our problems are increasing in scope and magnitude, and we can't do anything about them, and why are the morals of our society continually plummeting to an even lower level? These are all fair questions. And many, many people have asked these questions. In fact, if we were to go around um, and ask all of you, and you could put it in the comments section, but if we were to solicit your opinions watching online, most of the things you say would probably be right. But did you know that in Bible prophecy, God has an answer for us. I'm going to say amen. You see, in fact, God comes right out and tells us why we are facing these things in the world today. So I'd like to invite you to take your Bible. We're going to go to the book of Hosea, chapter 4. What book? Hosea. And Hosea is not hard to find. All you do is go to the book of Daniel, where we've been a, quite a few times, and Hosea is just one book forward. One book forward. We're going to go to Hosea 4 and verse 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Now, this is important because this is one of our foundational texts for this evening. And this is God speaking through the prophet Hosea. And God is looking down from heaven and he begins to describe what he sees. And the Bible says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committing adultery. They break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. So as we stop there, 
God looks at the people of Israel, and he is also seeing what is taking place in these pagan nations around them. And as Hosea describes the society of his day, it almost sounds as if he's reading straight from a newspaper or a social media website in the 21st century. God says he sees lying and stealing and people killing each other with no self-control. Bloodshed upon bloodshed. Sounds a lot like the world we live in today, doesn't it? But what is so shocking about this is God is not speaking to the pagan or the heathen nations who do not know him. He is talking about his own people, Lord have mercy, the children of Israel. In fact, in verse 6, God comes right out and tells them why they are facing these problems. God doesn't use symbolism, brothers and sisters. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's plain, he's direct, and he's straight to the point. So let's pick it up here in verse 6. In Hosea 4, in verse 6, the, the word says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of God. Now, there are two reasons here. Two reasons. God gives two main reasons why their society is plumbing. Number one, it's lack of spiritual knowledge. And number two, it is the forgotten law of God. The forgotten law of God. So they have turned away from the principles of God's word. And more specifically, God says you have forgotten the law that I have given to you. And if you remember how God in the Ten Commandments had given the nation of Israel principles to follow, principles of happiness, principles of, of morality. God had told them, if you honor these principles, if you keep these laws, you will have a happy, healthy, and a stable society that will be an example to the rest of the world. And your families will be strong. Your neighborhoods will be strong. But if you turn away from these principles of happiness, you will face pain and sorrow, and things will begin to fall apart, and that's exactly what happened. God gave them his law, and when God gave them his law, it didn't get any better. They turned away from it, and God says, that's why you are facing these problems in your society. Do you realize we are running almost exactly parallel to the land of Israel back in Hosea's day? In our secularized world today, the majority has thrown away the principle of God's word. And when it comes to God's holy Ten Commandments, the secular world says we don't need them anymore. The Ten Commandments, they're archaic. They're irrelevant. They're old-fashioned. And modern people don't need to be guided by such ancient principles. As a result, our morals are decreasing. Our morals are decreasing. Our societies are plummeting. We find ourselves falling deeper and deeper into degradation, and we cannot solve the problem. And the question is why? Because God says we have turned away from his principle of happiness. So God could have just created us and said, I gave you life. Now you're on your own. But God says, because I love you so much, I'm going to give you principles to follow that will bless your life. And if you follow them, you will have happiness. If you follow them, you will experience the greatest blessings of life. But our secular world has decided to reject them. They decided to reject them. So God's law is a big issue in the book of Revelation. And this is why we are studying the subject in prophecy tonight, or whatever time you're watching this. And here's what you will discover. God's law becomes a big issue in the book of Revelation. Revelation describes God's people at the end of time of those who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. And this great crisis that happens at the end of time is going to force people to make a choice between man's law and God's law. And we're going to see that in just a few minutes. We're going to see it in just a few minutes. If you, we want to understand prophecy, we got to know what God teaches about his own law. So we're going to spend some time doing that right now. 
And let's put the Ten Commandments on the screen and briefly go through them to see if we can find anything that is archaic or irrelevant for our world today. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Number one. And then, so that makes sense. Just as we don't want our spouse to go off with someone else, God wants us to be faithful to him. Commandment number two, thou shalt have no graven images. That makes sense because why worship something that is made of wood or stone when we can have a living God who literally hears us? Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. In other words, we must respect God's name, use proper language, not profane language, and we should never misrepresent the name of God. Commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In other words, God gives us a time to rest and worship him and grow in our relationship with Jesus, and that makes sense. We all need rest, especially in this stressful world. Number five is honor thy father and thy mother. So God wants us to have a happy and strong family tie in our life. Number six, thou shalt not kill. And if, and if we only kept that one, this world would be a much better place. Go on and say amen, somebody. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. And that's certainly not irrelevant. God knows when man, marriages fall apart, there is so much pain in a person's life, and God wants something better for us than that. Number eight, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. So respect what belongs to others. That makes sense. Thou shalt not bear false witness. In other words, be truthful about the things that you are saying. And lastly, commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet, so be thankful for what the Lord has given you. And if you're always wanting what somebody else has, you're never, ever going to be happy. So God has given us these principles of happiness because he loves us. But years ago, back in the early 1900s, most of society thought these commandments were very important. And most of the societies back then in the early 20th century thought that we need to honor these principles of happiness and they were taught in our homes, they were taught in our schools, they were displayed in government buildings, and they were preached from our church pulpits. But as we fast forward a hundred years to the early 21st century, all that has changed. There has been a definite shift in thinking and attitude, and now we're not teaching them at home. They're not being taught in the school system. You definitely cannot display them in a government building, and you rarely ever hear them preach from the Christian pulpits today. Lord have mercy. In fact, even within Christianity, we often hear things like this. We hear these excuses. That was for the Jews. They are outdated. The law was nailed to the cross, and we are under grace now. As if to say that the principles of happiness are no longer needed. So the big question that we have to ask is twofold. Number one. Does the Bible teach those things? And secondly, whether you are a religious person or not, anyone can see that our societies are plummeting. So question number two is this. If that's happening, why in the world would this planet want to do away with God's principles of happiness? And why would the religious world go right along with it? Well, that's a great question. And here's what you will discover. It is no accident. It is no accident. Did you get that? Because in Bible prophecy, God warned us that this shift in thinking would happen. Did you know that in the book of Daniel, God warned us that the spirit of the Antichrist would be working in this world to try to pull people away from God and to pull people away from his holy law. And I want to take you to a revealing passage. It's in the book of Daniel. And we're going to look at this as a key passage for today. I want to go to Daniel 7 and verse 25. He's going to tell us why that shift in thinking is taking place because the Bible describes right here the work of the Antichrist. In fact, God will reveal to us what are the things that the Antichrist will do in this world. And later in the seminar, we're going to spend a whole night on this particular chapter. But just for tonight, I want to scratch the surface by drawing our attention to something that is written in verse 25 about the activities of the Antichrist. You don't want to miss this. It's rather eye-opening. So in Daniel 7 and verse 25, the Word of God says this, 
he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and shall persecute, persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Well, if you have the King James Version, it says he shall think to change times and laws. We're going to dig deeply into this a little bit later, but for now, here's what I want you to notice. It says that the Antichrist works against two entities, the Most High and his saints, or his people. And it is specifically said that he would think to change times and laws. In its context, it's talking about God's times and God's laws. So what Bible prophecy is telling us is that the spirit of the Antichrist will be working in this world to try to turn us away from the Most High God and His laws, and that's exactly what you see happening today. This prophecy is being fulfilled even within the last hundred years as we see a definite change in thinking towards God's principles of happiness. In fact, I want you to notice something here, what the book of Revelation says about God's law. We just read in Daniel that the Antichrist would think to change God's times and laws. But now I want you to notice something that the book of Revelation says about God's people during the end times. Revelation 14 and verse 12. Revelation 14 and verse 12 says this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation is describing God's people at the end of time. It is describing God's church in the last days. They are saints. And the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation specifically describes them as those who are keeping the commandments of God because of their faith in Jesus Christ. I'll say amen for you. I'll say amen for you. Brothers and sisters, if you read a few verses before that, the third angel of Revelation 14 is warning people about worshiping the beast and his image. We're going to get to that a little bit later, but what Revelation is telling us is that in the last days, there will be clearly two groups of people. In fact, one group will follow the beast and worship his image, while the other group, God's people, will keep the commandments. So whatever the final crisis involves, Revelation has already told us it revolves around the commandments of God in some sort of way. One group will follow man's law. The other group follows God's law at all costs. It reminds us of Cain and Abel. Cain chose to follow his own law while Abel followed the law of God. So if we want to clearly understand the issues in the book of Revelation, we have got to know what the Bible teaches about God's law. I'll say amen for you. If we don't, we will never understand the book of Revelation properly. In fact, we must understand on one hand that there are groups that say God's law was nailed to the cross. It is not important anymore. And being under grace means that we don't need to observe those principles. Yet the book of Revelation describes God's church at the end of time as keeping his commandments. So since there are these two conflicting schools of thought, we have to make sure we understand what scripture teaches concerning this subject. So if Revelation speaks about it, that means that it is important. I wish somebody would go on and say amen. So we're going to start off with the Old Testament, and we're going to journey all the way to the New Testament and see what God's Word teaches us on this subject. That's the way you understand Revelation. Before we go into Revelation and try to fill in the blanks with our own opinions, we've got to start at the beginning of the Bible and get a clearer understand this is how you let the bible interpret itself and that's what we seek to do every single night that we look at the word of god amen so now we're going to go to the book of exodus 31 exodus 31 and verse 18 the word of god says and when he had made an end of the speaking with him on mount sinai or mount sinai he gave moses two tablets of the testimony tablets of stone written with the finger of god so two important things are mentioned in the verse. He said that he had made an end of the speaking with him on Mount Sinai, and he gave Moses two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. It was literally written with the finger of God. I'll say amen for you. So two important parts are mentioned here. It was 
written on stone, and it was written with the finger of God. He didn't put them on paper. He didn't put them on any other material where it could fade away or rot away. He wrote them in stone. That ought to tell us that something about per that a permanent law that God attaches to his holy law, it's permanent. In fact, when you think about it, we have a figure of speech that we even use in our world today and that is very much connected to what we just read here in the Bible. When we want to communicate to someone that, so that something's never going to change, we say that it is written in stone. That's right. It means there is no ending to it. And this figure of speech actually comes all the way from the Bible right here in the book of Exodus. Right here in the book of Exodus. Number two. Do you notice what instrument God used to write his law? Well, he used his finger. Notice he didn't, didn't use a pen or a writing instrument. He didn't dictate it to Moses for him to write down. He wrote it with his own finger. Now think about it for a second. That means that the Ten Commandments are the only part of God's word that God did not trust man to write for himself. I'll say amen for you. So when it comes to the rest of the canon of Scripture, God did not dictate the Bible word for word. No, the Bible says that God inspired holy persons of old with divine thoughts, which they wrote down in their own words. But when it came to his law, God wrote it with his own finger. That's how important the law of God must be. So some may say Mount Sinai, that's the beginning point of God's law, right? Well, that's not true. His law existed well before this. In Genesis 26.5, Abraham is described as keeping God's commandments. Let's go there. Genesis 6 and verse 25. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. So Abraham, known as the father of the faithful, honored the commandments of God, but actually God's law existed even before Abraham. You can go all the way back to the beginning of Earth's history, back to Adam and Eve. You can go back to Cain and Abel, right? You want to know what that is, and, and th here it is for you, but Cain and Abel. And let me ask you a question. When Cain killed Abel, was that a sin, yes or no? How many people agree that it's a sin? If you believe it's a sin, put it in the comment section. This is not a trick question, but let me ask you something else. If the Ten Commandments did not exist back then, how could God punish Cain for something he did not know that was wrong? If thou shalt not kill did not exist in the beginning, how could God punish Cain for something he would have been unaware of? Did God punish Cain? He did. He put him on to him. He was a wanderer on the earth. So right here it tells us that Cain and Abel and their parents Adam and Eve were familiar with the law of God. And God shared it with them orally. Now, you may say, how do you know that? Well, back in Genesis chapter 2, it says that God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. They had regular communion together, and God shared his principles of happiness with them, and it was not until the time of Moses that God put these principles on to stone. Now, do you know why he put them on stone? Because God had already witnessed numerous times how apt man is to forget. I want you to think about it. Sometime after Adam and Eve were created, Cain and Abel were born, and sometime later Cain killed Abel, and they forgot God's law, and that's why at the end of time there will be two groups of people. There will be two classes of people. There will be one class that will uh, believe that they're going to get to heaven on their own merit, just like Cain did. He felt that his sacrifice was good enough but then there will be others who need divine mediation from God, just like Abel, who gave the sacrifice to God, which is what he asked for. So Cain, he went against what God wanted. Abel followed God. Cain became jealous, and then he killed his own brother. He killed Abel, and they forgot God's law. By the time you get... Only five chapters into the Bible, it says that the world was filled with such wickedness. God had to destroy it with a flood. They forgot God's law not long after that. 
You read about the Tower of Babel or Babel where the world rebelled against God and God had to confuse their language. And you ask why? Well, they forgot God's law. They had forgot God's law. In the time of Moses, because God knows how man forgets, he decided to write it on stone. Amazingly enough, even after that, it only took man just 40 days to forget because in Exodus 31, this is the second time Moses goes up to get the commandments. Now, do we remember what happened the first time? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, Moses was gone for 40 days. Only 40 days. And when he came down from the mountain, the Israelites were already dancing and worshiping around the golden calf. And Moses was so frustrated. He was so upset at what was happening here. He could not stand it. And what had happened was, is he was frustrated with them because they had heard God speak these commandments from the cloud above the mountain. Moses throws the tablets down. The commandments break, symbolizing in a way that what Israel had done. They had broke this covenant. Now, believe it or not, you can actually go even farther back than the beginning of this world. God's law has existed from all eternity because God's law is really a description of his character. And the principles of the Ten Commandments are the principles of his government. The principles of the Ten Commandments are the principles of his government. God's law, that's God's character. And, and the law is love, and God is love. And, and who was the very first being to break God's law anyway? Well, it was Lucifer. Remember, we studied this just the other night. Lucifer, Satan, was once a mighty angel in the courts of heaven. However, he lost his love for God. He began to deceive the other angels into believing that God was not love, that God could not be trusted, that his law was not important for angelic beings to follow. And as a result, Lucifer and the angels that followed him were cast out of heaven because they brought woe and suffering even to the very courts of heaven. Which brings us to the three commandments that Lucifer broke. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. In Ephesians 5 and verse 18, the word of God says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the Greek, it is saying to be continually and repeatedly filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is who gives us the desire to want to honor God's law. Now the Holy Spirit writes that law on our hearts and we honor God's law through the power of the Holy Spirit who then lives in us. What else did he break? Well, you shall not bear false witness and you shall not covet. So we see here that Lucifer broke this commandment number nine. He lied to the angels about the character of God. And lastly, he broke number 10. He coveted the throne of God so much that he was willing to instigate a full-scale rebellion to get it. And so of turning away from the principles of happiness brought suffering even in heaven. What makes us think that turning away from God's law won't do the same thing here on this earth? You see, Lucifer is conducting this same rebellion right here on the earth. You see, the more we turn away from the principles of the happiness that God gave us from the beginning, the more our societies and our home and our neighborhoods will plunge deeper and deeper into trouble. And so often the world turns around and blames God for our mess, even though, even though he has given us the principles of happiness from the very beginning. Brothers and sisters, the fact that God gives us his law tells us that he loves us so much we seem to believe that God is just being a party pooper sometimes. That we can't do this and we can't do that. How many people out there watching have children? Do you ever tell your children you shouldn't do something? You may not use the exact words that thou shalt not. And we, you may say don't do this, don't do that. And I know that happens a lot in, in, in families. And, and why do we tell children not to do something? Well, because there is danger involved. And this is why God gave us the Ten Commandments, because he knows what's best for you and I. It's not to spoil our fun. It's because he is looking out for us. 
so that we can live long, healthy lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. We're going to look at, at verses 17 to 18. And, and in fact, what is this passage called? Well, we know it as the Sermon on the Mount. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. And this is by far the greatest sermon that was ever preached. Jesus gave us the principles of Christianity in three simple chapters. He gave us the basic summary of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and to follow the religion of Christ and of all the things he would have covered. One of the things that he felt was essential is what our attitude should be towards God. So in Matthew 5, verse 17, in verse 18, it says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until it is finished. Amen? So it tells us that he did not think to destroy the law or the prophets, that not one jot and not one tittle will by no means pass from the law until it is fulfilled. Now, notice verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, here is the issue. Here is the issue. If you're going to break a Ten Commandment, you might as well go first class to hell and break all the Ten Commandments. Because if you only break one, you're breaking them all. So if you're going to go to hell, you might as well go first class. I wish I had a witness in this place. You see, brothers and sisters, there are things we need to pay attention to in this passage. In verse 17, Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. And the Ten Commandments are a part of this. And Jesus said he had no intention of destroying it or minimizing it. In fact, Jesus goes on to say, as long as heaven and earth are here, nothing will pass from my law. Nothing. Now, these are not words that we use in 21st century very much. What is a jot or a tittle? It's basically the crossing of a T and the dotting of an I. Just like a legal contract, you've got to cross your T's and dot your I's. And Jesus said, as long as heaven and earth are still here, we are going to need the principles of his law to have happy, healthy, stable societies, families, and lives. And now as a minister, verse 19 really gets my attention. And here's why. Jesus actually pronounces a woe on anyone who teaches others to ignore his law. Now, I don't want Jesus to pronounce a woe on me. Are you following me? This is a very serious thing. He says they will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And that's really a play on words because they are not going to be in the kingdom of heaven at all. Now this highlights a temptation for a minute. You say, what do you mean? I'm going to let you into the heart of a minister for the next minute or two, if that's all right. I'm going to share with you some of the temptations as ministers that we face. Ministers have a trait of human nature just like many people in our world. We want to be liked and we don't like to have enemies and we don't like to have people criticize us because it hurts. And as a result, there are times when we are tempted to say, you know what, I don't want to preach that part of God's word because it's too direct. Somebody might get upset with me. And we're tempted to choose certain things in the word of God that will not upset anybody so we don't talk about sin, don't step on toes, don't lovingly challenge a church to grow. And when you upset people for teaching that which is true, your church may not grow to be the biggest church in town. And sometimes when the truth goes up, attendance goes down. When the church attendance goes down, the church offerings go down. And when the church offerings go down, the church pills pile up. And when the church salaries go down, so the temptation sometimes for us as ministers, is to preach those things that will make people love us and never really address serious subjects. But the Word of God tells us that we cannot skip some teachings just because they are difficult to hear. 
back to mind, be easier for me to say, don't worry about the principle of God's law, but God says, I need to preach the whole counsel of his word. I realize I do say some things in this seminar that may not be what popular belief is, but it's because I take seriously that we need to lift up God's word because it is his word that sets us free. Go on and say amen, somebody. And it's his word that brings us ultimate happiness. I'll say amen for you. There's another verse where Jesus sums it up very beautifully. In John 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, If you want to earn your way to heaven, keep my commandments. If you want to be a legalist, keep my commandments. If you don't believe in grace, keep my commandments. If you want to gain righteousness, keep my commandments. No, he said, If you love me, Keep my commandments. If you appreciate what I have done on the cross of Calvary, if you recognize that I've given you a gift that you can never give yourself, that I have given you righteousness so that you can enter into the kingdom of heaven, if you can recognize that, if you love me, then keep my commandments. See, we don't honor the commandments because we are trying to be saved. We honor the commandments because we are already saved through the blood of Jesus is our opportunity to show appreciation. And when people see the Holy Spirit living these commandments out in our lives, hopefully in the workplace, hopefully in our homes, in our neighborhoods, people can look at us and see just a little picture of the character of Jesus. I'll say amen for you. We're going to go to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4. And notice what it says. It says, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Are you following me? Now, you talk about cutting like a knife. He utters a profound truth, and John was there at the Last Supper when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Was John there at the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said that nothing will pass from his law until it is all filled? Well, of course he was. Of course he was brothers and sisters, we have to make a decision. John is just reiterating what Jesus said. If I claim that I love Jesus, okay, and I am a disciple of Christ, but in my life I purposely and willfully refuse to follow his commandments, then I am a liar. And there is something not genuine and insincere about my witness. Let's go to Revelation 14 and verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is why Revelation at the end of time is describing God's people this way. Notice the commandment keeping and a faith relationship with Jesus always goes hand in hand, particularly right here in the book of Revelation. In these last days we must choose, do we follow man's law or are we going to follow God's law? This is the question. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus is reaching out to us, brothers and sisters, and he wants us to follow him. It says this in Romans 1 and verse 20. In Romans 1, I'm sorry, Romans 3 and verse 20, the word of God says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, the law cannot make us clean. It can't make us perfect or righteous. But the job of the law is to show us that we fall short of God's standard, that we have sin in our lives, and it points us to the one who can take care of that sin, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So here's the law's purpose. That means the law's purpose is to point us to Jesus. The law points us to the cross. I'm going to go on and say amen for you. Brothers and sisters, this is why Daniel in Revelation tells us that in the end, God's law is going to be the issue that the great controversy centers on. So you and I must choose. If we want to follow God tomorrow, then by His grace, we need to choose to follow Him today. We need to choose to follow Him today. Brothers and need to make a decision. We need to begin to make a decision in our lives. 
I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what kind of struggles that are happening for you. But if you look in a mirror, it can reveal that we are dirty. But the mirror cannot clean you. The purpose of the mirror is simply to point you to the one who can clean you. And so the mirror of God's law points us to the cross. It points me to the blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins that can wash me and make me clean and make me white as snow. Brothers and sisters, so we can come to Jesus just as we are. We can come to Jesus with all of our sin, with all of our shortcomings. I'm wrapping up here. With all of our mistakes, we can take his cloth, representing the blood of Jesus, and wipe our face. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says he washes us and makes us clean because of his death on the cross, and it feels good to be clean. How many people say, I'm clean? Well, guess what? I can't see it. How do I know you're not lying to me? And when I go to Walmart, or if I, I go out to the market uh, down in the local town with dirt on my face, that the clerk will look at me like I'm crazy. And when you're going through the villages, quite easy to get a little dirty. So what do we need to do and what do we need to know if we are clean? Well, we need to look in the mirror. Yes, I am clean. The character of Jesus is starting to be formed in me. Before I looked in the mirror, did I know that my face was clean? Well, no. I am clean because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. The law is the mirror that points me to Jesus. So the law shows me what I have done wrong and points me to Jesus, but it cannot clean me. So the law shows me where I fall short, but the law also points me to the one who can change me and make me whiter than snow, the one that can make me clean. And it's not just somebody, it's Jesus. That's why the devil wants to do away with God's law because it shows people that they need a Savior, and it points people to Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, there are lots of great promises. In fact, in Matthew 11 and verse 28, Matthew 11 and verse 28 in the CEV version, it says this, if you're tired from carrying heavy burdens, just come to me, and I will give you rest. Brothers and sisters, if you're tired of the burdens of sin, if you're wanting that guilt and shame to be removed, if you're just wanting peace in your life, if you're wanting Jesus' perfect life to count for you, say, come to me, I'll give you rest. Jesus says this to us. I will give you confidence. I will give you the assurance of salvation because when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, his perfect life, is then substituted in place of your imperfect life. So when God looks at the record of your life in the time of judgment, he doesn't see all of your mess. He sees the perfect life of Jesus now counts for you. God sees you as though you have never sinned, and that's what it means to have Christ as a personal Savior. Is that something that you want in your life? Because tonight, are you willing to say in your heart, Lord Jesus, I want you to transform me. I want you to change me. Lord, I give you permission to write the principles of your law on my heart. I want your Holy Spirit to fill my life. And if that is your desire tonight, and you just want to say, Lord, I don't claim to be perfect of myself, but I want you to begin writing the principles of your law on my heart. I want you to be King of Kings. Lord of Lords, I want you to be my Savior of all saviors. I want to be born again. And if this is you, if this is your desire, I'd like to invite you, wherever you're at at home, wherever you're at at a church, to stand with me as we have a closing prayer tonight. And we're going to pray, and, there's going, and then we're going to have a number that's going to pop up after we pray, and you can make a decision for Jesus tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, so often we are well aware of where we fall short. And you know, Lord, how the devil seeks to throw that in our face and take away the assurance of salvation. Tonight, we present ourselves to you. We understand there is a controversy that is 
surrounding your law. And, and tonight, uh, we give you permission to change and transform us. We want to experience peace. We want to experience victory. We want you, Lord, to write the law in our hearts so that people can see Jesus in you. So, Father, help us, strengthen us, and change us as we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and amen. Or well, again, there's going to be a number. It's going to pop up on the screen. You can call that number. You can text that number. And if you want to say, I want to follow God's law, I want to follow God's law because I want to be in a loving relationship with him. If that is you, text that number, call that number, and they will connect you with somebody locally or they will connect you with me directly. But call that number. Maybe you have a prayer request. Maybe you need us to pray with you so that you can make a decision to be baptized or rebaptized. Whatever the situation may be, I am calling on you now to make that decision for Jesus Christ. We're going to be praying for those decisions that have been made. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow night. May the Lord bless you and keep you and give you peace and grace. God bless. And we'll see you again.